welcome to this class. I am Uban Kerstin, and I'm here to take you on the subject, chemistry. The theme of our lesson is chemistry and industry, and our topic is iron. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to state the relative abundance of iron ore in nature. Okay, you should be able to describe the process of extracting iron from its ores. You should also be able to state the causes of rusting in iron and state the different ways available for preventing rusting. And lastly, you should be able to state the physical and chemical properties of iron. So, what is iron? Iron is a chemical element that has the symbol Fe, and this is gotten from the Latin name ferrum. So, it is the second most abundant metal on the earth crust after aluminium. It is also the second most abundant element after hydrogen in the universe. Now, on the periodic table, we'll find iron as part of a group known as transition metals, okay? Iron specifically belongs to the first transition series, which is the first series here on the fourth period. So we we'll see the position of iron here. Okay, it has an atomic number of 26, an atomic mass of 55.847. It has a melting point of 1,538 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 2,000. 862 degrees Celsius. Now, iron in the human body is present in hemoglobin. Also, in animals, iron is present. In plants, it is present as chlorophyll. Iron does not occur freely in nature because it's a very reactive metal, but it is found as what? Iron ore. So, what are iron ores? Iron ores are minerals from which Metallic iron is extracted from. There are different types of iron ores, and we'll be seeing some of them that are most common and um, have a high abundance of iron in them. First one we have here, we have hematite, which is actually ferric oxide, and it has 69.9% iron in it, okay? We have magnetite, another iron ore, which is actually ferrous ferric oxide, and it has a high abundance of iron at 72.4%. We have siderite, known as ferrous carbonate. It has 48.2% iron. We also have another iron ore called limonite, also known as ferric oxide trihydrate, and we have geothite. It has iron content of 62.9%. So these are different iron ores, okay, and the percentage of iron found in them. Now these ores are present in different colors. For example, you can see the color of hematite here. It has a reddish brown color. You can see limonite has a golden yellow color. Magnetite as well. Siderite, they all have different colors. And these colors range from dark gray to bright yellow, rusty red, deep purple, etc. Now, these iron ores are also rich in oxides. Now, in Nigeria, iron ores are found in large quantities in states such as Anambra, Kogi, and Edo states. Now, in Kogi states, areas such as Ajokuta, Jeba, and Lokoja are rich in iron ores and these iron ores serve as important raw materials for the iron and steel industry in the nation. Now we're going to be looking at how iron is extracted from its ores. Remember that we say that iron is a very reactive metal and as such it is not found naturally. It is not found as the metal iron in nature. Okay, so the ores are usually extracted or dug from the earth, and then the iron itself undergoes different extraction processes in order to get them out in their pure form. So, in order to extract iron from its ores, the raw materials that are usually needed are iron ore. Of course, we need the ore that contains the iron. So, an iron ore, it could be the hematite, it could be the geotite, or any other 
ore that is very rich in iron. The second raw material will be coke. Now this coke serves to react with oxygen in order to form carbon monoxide which is needed to reduce the iron oxide. Another raw material that will be needed for the extraction of iron is limestone also known as calcium carbonate. Now this limestone serves to remove impurities from the iron by reacting with them to form what to call molten slag. Then lastly we would have air. Of course this air is a source of oxygen that is needed for the extraction process. So it serves to allow the coke to burn and produce heat. Now let us look at how the extraction process. Now iron is extracted in a furnace known as the blast furnace. Here we have an image of the blast furnace. Okay, so in this furnace, of course, the iron ore we talked about will be mixed with coke and limestone, the first three raw materials. They will mix together. Now, these raw materials are loaded into the furnace from the top. Okay, so from this top, as you can see, we have iron ore, carbon, and limestone being put into this furnace from the top. Okay, now hot air will now be introduced from the bottom of this furnace. So from here, we have air being introduced into the same furnace. So the first three raw materials are coming from the top and air is coming from the bottom. Now, these raw materials are heated to a very high temperature. Now, the temperature at the top of the furnace is going to be about 200 degrees Celsius, while that near the bottom of this furnace is going to be about 2,000 degrees Celsius. This high temperature causes the coke to turn white. So the now white hot coke will be oxidized to carbon dioxide by the oxygen from the hot air blast. All right? So the coke is oxidized. This is an exothermic reaction as lots of heat is released in the process of oxidation. So coke, which is actually carbon plus oxygen, will give us carbon dioxide. Now, this reaction, okay, would reduce the amount of the available oxygen as the coke is reacting with the oxygen, is reducing the amount of the oxygen in the air, okay? So, the carbon dioxide forms becomes reduced to carbon monoxide due to insufficient supply of oxygen, all right? So, we have the carbon dioxide being reduced to what? Carbon monoxide. Now, this carbon monoxide produced will react with the iron oxide to reduce it to iron. Okay, so we have an equation where the carbon monoxide reacts with the iron oxide. This is still happening in the blast furnace. So this will now give us the iron metal and carbon dioxide. Now, this iron that has been formed at this stage is in the molten form, okay? Now, this molten iron formed at this point will now sink to the bottom of the furnace, okay? And it will run out through these outlets, all right? So, it will be tapped off from there and it will be run into molds. So, if you have molds of this shape, when the iron solidifies, it's going to have this shape, all right? So when it sets, the iron that comes out directly from the blast furnace, okay, when it sets, is called pig iron. So that is the raw form of iron, fresh out of extraction. The limestone, remember the limestone, one of the raw materials that was put into this blast furnace. The limestone, remember we said that its work is to help remove the impurities by forming a molten slag with them. So it decomposes at high temperature to yield calcium oxide, okay? So we have limestone being decomposed to calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Now the calcium oxide formed would combine with silica, which is also sand, and impurities in that ore we used hematite as an example. So it's going to combine with impurities in this hematite to form calcium trioxosilicate 4 or calcium silicate. Now, this calcium 
triazosilicate 4, and several other impurities that was left behind in the blast furnace will now form a molten slag, and this slag would float on top of the molten iron. So we would have the iron coming down this way, and we'll have the slag somewhere at the top here. And um, these impurities, this molten slag, can easily be tapped off or removed separately from the blast furnace. So this is basically how iron is extracted using the blast furnace. Remember, we said the raw materials are an iron ore, coke, limestone, and air. Now, we'll be looking at types of iron and their uses. They are pig iron, cast iron, wrought iron, and steel. Now, let us quickly take a look at each of these types of iron. Now, pig iron. Remember what we said about the raw form of iron that comes out from the blast furnace, okay? That first iron, that pure form of iron is the pig iron. So this is the first raw form of iron obtained directly from the blast furnace. Now, this iron still contains some level of impurities. It contains 5% carbon along with traces of other impurities such as sulfur, phosphorus, manganese, silicon, etc. So the presence of these impurities will lower the melting point of this iron from 1538 degrees Celsius to 1200 degrees Celsius because it is not pure iron. So the melting point is going to be reduced. Now pig iron is hard and it's quite brittle and it doesn't really have much use. Most times this pig iron is further purified into the higher level iron metal before it is used. So most times it is worked into steel or wrought iron, which is now used in making things such as building materials. So here we have pig iron fresh from the blast furnace. Then next we have is cast iron. Pig iron can be transformed to cast iron, okay? And the way we can transform pig iron to cast iron is by remelting the pig iron with some scrap iron and cooling it in mold. So we can get the solidified pig iron and melt it again. And when we do that, we melt it with some scrap iron. And then when it is cooled in molds, it sets as what? Cast iron. Now this cast iron has a lower percentage of carbon. It has 2.1 to 4% carbon. And it also has lower percentage of other impurities than pig iron. So it still contains some impurities, okay? But the impurities it contains is lower than what is contained in pig iron. Cast iron is also hard and brittle, although not as hard and brittle as pig iron. So it cannot be forged or welded because of this reason. Cast iron also has a low melting point and expands slightly when it is cooled. We have different types of cast iron. We have the malleable cast iron, the ductile cast iron, gray cast iron, and white cast iron. Now, objects that do not require high tensile strength are usually made from cast iron. And we have the raw form of cast iron here, and you can see some objects such as skillets that we use in cooking, some stoves, pots, okay, ornamental products that can be made from cast iron. Cast iron is also used in the making of pipes, especially underground pipes, machines, automotive industry parts such as cylinder heads, and also in the construction of buildings. Next, we have the wrought iron. Now, the wrought iron is known as the purest form of iron with just 0.1 to 0.25% carbon. So you see that the lesser the amount of carbon in these types of iron, the purer the iron material. So here, this carbon content is quite low at 0.1 to 0.25%, and it is known as the purest form of iron. It is made by heating cast iron, okay, with hematites in a furnace. So when 
cast iron is heat with this hematite. Remember, it's an iron ore. Okay, in a furnace, we can get wrought iron. Any other impurities present, such as phosphorus and silicon oxide, are oxidized and removed from the furnace as slag. Wrought iron is quite soft, but it is malleable and it is tough and it is ductile, so it can be easily welded or forged into different shapes. And because of this, it finds very wide usage. For example, it is used in making materials such as nails, wires, chains, as you can see in the images, are images that wrought iron can be used to produce because of how malleable it is. It is quite soft, okay? So it can be easily forged. So materials or items that require great care, such as these furniture items, can be made from wrought iron. It is also used in making agricultural equipment, water and steam pipes, railway couplings, etc. Still, now this type of iron contains 0.12 to 2% carbon and a varying amount of other elements. It is made by first removing impurities from the molten pig iron, okay, and then adding known amount of carbon and other components in order to get the desired composition of steel. Because steel has different compositions. For example, my steel contains 0.1 to 0.25% carbon. Okay? We have the medium steel, which contains 0.25 to 0.6% carbon. And we have the hard steel, which contains 0.6 to 1.5% carbon. So depending on the composition of steel required, a certain amount of carbon will need to be added to pig iron. Now, steel has a very wide range of uses due to its high tensile strength and low cost. It is quite easy to make steel. As we saw, it's just working directly with molten pig iron and just adding a certain percentage or composition of carbon. So producing steel does not cost much and then steel has a very high tensile strength. And because of it, it is known as the most commonly used iron material. It is used mainly in construction industries, such as the making of roofing components, such as these roofing sheets we have here. It is used in energy, such as in the making of gas and oil wells, pipelines and turbines. It is used in packaging, such as in making food and beverage cans. It is used in making home appliances, such as our ovens, microwaves, and sinks. It is used in transportation, such as in making of our train and car parts. It's also used in fashion. It can also be used in making of fashion items, such as our wristwatches. So rusting is a chemical process that describes the corrosion or decay of iron and its alloys, okay? So we're looking at the causes of rusting. Rusting is caused by the presence of oxygen and moisture on an iron object. So we see that the two main reasons why rust forms on iron items is because of oxygen and water. So when iron or an item containing iron comes in contact with the oxygen in air or moisture in air, then rust is bound to form on that iron. So the iron oxide form is usually reddish brown, as you can see, that's the characteristic color of rust. As you can see here, we have an image of iron chains that have not undergone rusting that are still neat and pure. And we can see these other iron chains that has undergone rust and the color they have formed. Okay, it's reddish brown in color. So this is what we know as rust. So it means that rust contains hydrated 
iron 3 oxide. Remember, we said that rust forms because the iron item comes in contact with water and air, oxygen in air, actually. So that rust is hydrated because of the presence of water, okay? So it's hydrated iron 3 oxide. Acids and salts are other substances that can speed up rusting in iron items. So this is how it happens. When iron comes in contact with oxygen, there is a transfer of electrons, okay? Remember, these are elements, and elements are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. So there is a transfer of electrons from the ion to oxygen to form ion to ions. So ion loses two of its electrons to form the ion. So the oxygen, in turn, forms hydroxide ions by accepting electrons in the presence of water, which is the moisture in air. So when oxygen accepts electrons from water, it's going to form this hydroxide ion. Now, this formed ion 2 plus undergoes a redox reaction to give ion 3 plus. So, in the presence of oxygen, of course, you know that we have the oxidation and the reduction in redox reaction. So, this ion will undergo a redox reaction in the presence of oxygen to form four atoms of ion 3. Now, the ion 2 and ion 3 formed undergo acid-base reactions with water to yield their hydrated forms. So we have the ion 2 and ion 3 reacting with water to give their hydrated forms. So this ultimately leads to the formation of hydrated ion oxides known as rust. So when we have this ion oxide, it's an ion material that is no longer ion but ion oxide. And when an iron item is no longer pure iron but iron oxide, we say that rust has formed on that iron item. Now, rust does not just form on a spot. This rust that starts from one part of an iron material will eventually spread to the entire iron when it starts at one place, causing the iron item to disintegrate and lose value. Of course, such iron chain that we have here on the board is no longer useful. It has lost its value while anyone can easily go for the pure iron chain. So this is what rusting does, okay? It causes an iron item to decay and lose its value. And that is what we try to prevent from happening. So we are going to be looking at methods that we can use to prevent rusting of iron items. So some of these methods are coating, cathode protection, and alloy formation. So what happens is that these methods work to stop oxygen and moisture from getting to the iron item. Remember we say that it is oxygen and moisture that causes rusting. So for rusting to be prevented, we need a method that can prevent this oxygen and moisture from getting to the iron item. And that is what these three methods try to do. So we have the first method of prevention, coating. Now coating simply involves applying another material over the iron material. Now this other material that is applied over the iron material serves as a cover or protection. So it just simply means applying a material that does not rust, okay, over the iron material to protect it from rusting. Now, some coating methods. We have galvanizing, use of grease and oil paint, thinning, electroplating, and oiling. Let us quickly take a look at each of these methods of coating. Galvanizing. Galvanizing, this method involves coating the iron material with a thin layer of zinc. So it is the use of zinc to coat or protect an iron item. 
So this simply works by stopping oxygen and water from reaching the metal that is now underneath the zinc coat. It works because zinc is more reactive than iron. If you are to look at the activity series of metals, you will find out that we have the most reactive metals and then we'll go down to the least reactive metals. And on that activity series, you'll see that zinc is higher than iron on the activity series. So if you apply zinc on an iron item to coat that iron, okay, what will happen is that the zinc will be attacked by the moisture on oxygen rather than the iron itself, thereby protecting the iron from rust. So the zinc would react with the oxygen in air or water, okay, instead of the iron material. So this action prevents rusting of the iron item and is known as sacrificial protection of a metal. Of course, you're sacrificing another metal to protect another one. So this is how it works. For example, zinc coating can be applied on an iron item. And what happens is that when rust comes, it will damage the upper layer, which is the zinc coating. And the underlying iron item will be protected. Use of grease and oil paint. This is used on large iron objects such as bridges, rails, and ships. Okay, they can be painted with oil paint or grease can be applied on them to prevent rusting. Okay, so example, nuts and bolts are greased. Car body parts can be painted. Thinning. Thinning is the use of a thin layer of tin, the metal tin. Okay to coat over an iron object in order to prevent rusting. For example, our food cans, our beverage cans, okay, most times they are coated with tin to prevent rusting. I know that rusting leads to food poisoning if it is allowed to come in contact with our food. So thinning is used to prevent this rusting from happening and also prevent food poisoning. Next is oiling. Oiling simply means lubricating, okay? So oil can be applied to iron objects such as bicycle chains, nuts and bolts, etc. to prevent moisture and oxygen from getting to the iron item, thereby preventing them from rusting. Then we have electroplating. This is the use of other metals to cover or coat an iron material. Most times metals used in electroplating are nickel, chromium, silver, and some other metals too. Now this method uses electrolysis of a solution that contains ions of the plating metal. So the iron item would be used as a cathode while the other metal will serve as the anode. This is a typical diagram showing how electroplating works. So the object that is being protected, which is the iron item, would be on the cathode side of the system while the anode would be either pure silver, nickel or chromium. Okay. Now, plating with chromium, for example, is usually done on water taps and car wheels to protect the iron and also to give them a polished look. So that's that for coating of what? Iron items. We'll be looking at cathode protection. Now, this is the use of reactive metals such as magnesium, zinc, or aluminium to prevent rusting. Now, thin amounts of any of these materials, okay, thin amounts of magnesium, zinc, or aluminium can be connected to the iron material so that when corrosion starts, the metal will wear off instead of the iron. So it's just bringing the iron material that you want to protect and getting any of these metals, okay, and connecting it to the iron so that when there is a contact with air, 
and water, this other metal will corrode instead of the iron material itself. So, for example, in making an iron magnesium voltaic cell, such as what we have here on the board, a steel pipe, okay, is what we want to protect. So, it can be connected to a metal such as magnesium, as we have here. We have the magnesium serving as the anode, while the steel pipe to be protected is the cathode, okay? This is happening on the ground. As you can see here, we have the surface of the ground. So this is usually constructed under the ground, this iron magnesium voltaic cell, all right? So this is the way it can be protected from rusting, all right? When this metal, magnesium, is connected to this pipe, the steel pipe, what happens is that the magnesium, which is more reactive, will be oxidized in the presence of oxygen, okay? So it will oxidize in preference to the iron. Remember that it is iron we are trying to protect. So magnesium is more reactive than iron. So this system comes in contact with oxygen, all right? The magnesium will be oxidized in place of the iron. And this is much easier because it is better to replace the magnesium rod, okay? Because this is just a magnesium rod that can be dug up and replaced with a new one. So it is easier to replace this magnesium rod than to dig up this whole iron pipeline. So it's an example of sacrificial protection of iron because we are sacrificing one metal in order to protect another metal. So that's that about cathode protection of iron. Then another way that iron can be prevented from rusting is by alloy formation. So to prevent iron from rusting, we can convert iron into its alloys by treating it with other metals or other elements that do not rust. Of course, we know that when two metals are made to come together, most times alloys are formed. And these alloys are better because they bring in the good qualities of two or three materials that make them up. And they make something that is stronger, more durable, and better. So when alloys are formed, okay, it means that iron, which is a material that easily rusts, can be mixed with other elements that do not easily rust in order to stop it from rusting. For example, we have the stainless steel. It's an iron alloy that does not rust. And you can see some products that are made from stainless steel do not actually rust. Okay? So we have our kitchenware, such as our pots and pans, we have our food flasks, and we have our refrigerator and cooker bodies. So these items made from stainless steel, which is an iron alloy, do not rust. So this is one way that rusting can be prevented. So with this, we finish what we have on rusting of iron. I'll be looking at some properties of iron, physical properties of iron. Some physical properties of iron include the following. Pure iron is a soft, silvery, white metal, okay? When iron has been extracted from its ore, it is, of course, soft before it solidifies. So that pure iron is soft and it has a silvery, white color. And at that point, it can be easily shaped and formed when it is still hot. Iron is a good conductor of heat and electricity, okay? It is malleable. This means that it has the ability to be bent into different shapes without breaking. It is ductile. Iron is ductile. This means that it has the ability to be pulled or stretched into a thin wire without breaking. Iron has a relative density of 7.9 and a melting point of 1,530 degrees Celsius. Iron is ferromagnetic. This means that 
it can be easily magnetized. Now let us look at some chemical properties of iron. Oxidation. Iron readily combines with oxygen to form its oxide. This brings us to what we just finished talking about, which is rusting. When iron oxidizes in the presence of oxygen, it forms rust. So that is a chemical reaction. And this is one of the properties of iron. It combines readily with oxygen in air to what form its oxide. So when it reacts with the oxygen in moist air, it forms what? A reddish brown oxide known as rust. Reaction of iron with steam. Iron reacts with very hot water or steam to give off hydrogen gas. Okay? For example, we can see this equation showing us where iron reacts with steam. Okay? It will give us what? Hydrogen gas. For example, when we pass steam over red hot iron filings, iron 2 diion oxide and hydrogen gas is produced. Reaction of iron with non-metals. Iron readily forms compound with non-metals such as chlorine, carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, etc. For example, when iron is heated, it readily combines with chlorine to give iron 3 chloride and when it is heated with sulfur, it gives iron 2 sulfide. Okay? So here we have where iron reacts with chlorine to give iron chloride and where it reacts with sulfur to give us iron sulfide. Reaction of iron with acids. Iron readily dissolves in some acids to give iron salts. For example, when iron reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid or tetrosulfate 6 acid, it gives iron 2 salts and hydrogen. So we have here iron reacting with tetrosulfate 6 acid to give us the iron sulfate and hydrogen gas. We also have where it reacts with hydrochloric acid to give us iron chloride and hydrogen gas. So with this, we have come to the end of this lesson on iron. Let us take a quick summary of all we have learned. Now we say that some iron ores and their abundance in nature are hematite with 69.9% iron, magnetite, 72.4% iron and siderite, 48.2% iron. And then we also say that extraction of iron from its ore requires raw materials such as iron ore itself, coke, limestone, and air. Types of iron include pig iron, cast iron, wrought iron, and steel. We also say that rusting is caused by the presence of oxygen and moisture on an iron object. Then lastly, we looked at the methods of preventing iron from rusting, which are coating, cathode protection, and alloy formation. Let us take some quick tests to help us remember what we have learned. Now, which of the following causes the rusting of iron. A. Paint. B. Moisture. C. Air. If your answer was paint A or C, that would be wrong. Our answer is moisture. We say that oxygen in air, not air itself, because air, of course, is a mixture of several gases. But it is the oxygen in air that causes rusting. Another question, which of the following is a raw material used in the extraction of iron from its ore? A, magnesium, B, sulfur, C, limestone. Well, the correct answer is C. Remember in the course for our lesson, we say that the raw materials needed for the extraction of iron from its ore are iron ore, coke, limestone or calcium carbonate, and air. So with this, we have come to the end of this lesson. Thank you for staying with me.